All right, 8th grade, we're back again for chapter 25 of To Kill a Mockingbird. We're breaking down this. Uh, once again, we have our color-coded noting terms up on our Google Doc, just like if we were back in the classroom. We're trying to keep things as normal as possible in your extended coronavirus shutdown, now without restaurants. But this chapter opens, Gems tells Scout not to crush a roly-poly, and those are those little pill bugs you see, and they look like trilobites. They've got all the little, they roll up into a ball when you poke at them, hence roly-poly. Um, this might be a reflection of Jem's new sensitivity towards the value of life following Tom's death. Jem has been hit pretty hard by this. He is an innocent who has definitely seen the effects of injustice in the world. He might be one of our symbolic mockingbirds. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That might be on a test or an essay in the future. Something for you to consider. Jem recounts how he and Dill accompanied Atticus to deliver the news to Tom's widow, Ooh, Helen, of Tom's death. All of Maycomb uses Tom's death, however, as an excuse to dismiss the injustice against Tom. They call it typical. They use it as an excuse to justify their prejudices. And while Helen Robinson is crushed by this, all of Maycomb uses, ah, well, that's what happens. They typical of a blank to cut and run, even though Atticus had a chance to get him off scot-free. They are doing nothing but using this as an excuse to justify their bigotry. And they throw a lot of out there. There's a lot of N-words used in this chapter describing Tom. People are immediately throwing it out as if all their prejudices have been justified in one moment. Regardless of the fact that he was there unjustly and that he knew he wasn't going to have a chance, which is something Scout reflects on at the end of the chapter. So he knew he didn't have a chance, so he decided, you know what? I'm going to try and go. And it didn't work out for him. Now, one person who does not go in on this is Braxton Bragg Underwood, who we met previously. He was the man with the shotgun back in the chapter where Atticus was sitting at the jail. He runs the newspaper for Maycomb. He's ironically named for Confederate General Braxton Bragg, who managed to lose almost every battle he fought, with the exception of Chickamauga, which I'm not sure I've spelled right. I'm pretty sure I've spelled it wrong. There you go. That's how it's spelled. Um, I think it's actually pronounced Chickamauga now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, but that was largely due to the aid of General James Longstreet showing up. He got removed from his command and withdrawn to Richmond, during the Civil War, after the Civil War, he ends up working for insurance for a few months, working for New Orleans for a few months, working for a railroad for a year, a few years, and then he dies of a brain aneurysm. Uh, doesn't really hold any long jobs, complains about everything, complains about everyone under him. Generally a poor general. Um, but the Braxton Bragg of our story produces an editorial comparing Tom's death to the senseless slaughter of songbirds by children. That should sound awfully familiar to any of you who've been paying attention. We've had this fits in our recurring motif. Remember that word motif, recurring image of the mockingbird and our theme of innocence being harmed by injustice going on here. We see both our motif and our theme reflected here. Our motif reflects our theme. A motif and a theme are not the same thing. That is very important to come to test. Um, in Mr. Underwood's view, regardless of circumstance, it's a sin to kill a cripple. And Bob Ewell is asked his views on Tom Robinson's death, which he makes abundantly clear. Um, one down, two to go. Now, I want you to think who those two might be. It's clear who the one is. That's Tom Robinson. So think about what other two people Bob Ewell wants dead, because that is the strong implication of what is going on there. What might this foreshadow? Now, Scout reflects on... Tom Robinson's fate, and she thinks, yeah, every tool that was used in a court of law was given to him, and there was still no chance. He never had a chance. Because in the secret court of men's hearts, where there's prejudice involved, he had already lost. Scout makes this clear. She comes to the realization that there is an inherent injustice, and she is not quite sure what can be done about it. And that's something that you guys might want to ponder, because there are injustices in our world, and the question is, what can be done about it, if anything? I'm not going to tell you. Uh, answers on these. If I had all the answers to this, I'd be running for office instead of teaching middle school. Uh, so something for you to reflect on is both what Bob Ewell's words might foreshadow and who these other two might be, and reflect on Scout's predicament and her view of how the world is. That's all, and I will see you guys for the stream tomorrow and back for chapter 26.